Hallo und herzlich willkommen zu einem neuen Video hier bei der Fanta Marina. Wie ihr wahrscheinlich unschwer erkennen könnt, befinde ich mich hier vor den Toren des Toberlands. Und ähm, ja, in diesem Video gibt es was ganz Besonderes. Ihr wisst wahrscheinlich, dass das Toberland hier den Bereich Avalon erweitert mit einigen Attraktionen für die Sommersaison 2023. Dazu gibt es hier auf dem Kanal ja schon das ein oder andere Update-Video, wo ich dann hier und da schon mal die Baustelle besucht habe. Heute gibt es was ganz Besonderes, denn wir betreten die Baustelle und schauen uns an, wie weit diese Bereiche sind und was uns dann im Sommer hier erwartet. Und ähm, ja, ich würde sagen, wir starten direkt in den Tag und ähm, was ich hier erlebe und wie die Baustelle aussieht, das erfahrt ihr jetzt gleich nach dem Intro. Also dranbleiben, bis gleich. Willkommen zurück im Video und ja, es geht jetzt langsam los. Wir haben jetzt hier gerade unser Programm halt bekommen. Es gibt jetzt erstmal lecker Frühstück und dann wird erstmal ein bisschen was erzählt zur Präsentation bzw. eine Präsentation zu den Entwürfen, was denn hier überhaupt entsteht für die Sommersaison 2023. Da gibt es noch eine frage antwort -Runde. Und dann geht's ähm, auf die Baustelle und ich würde sagen, wir stärken uns erstmal und dann sehen wir uns gleich wieder. you are fans and people are, who are enthusiastic about theme parks and tournaments in general and special. Uh, it's always great, I think, to, to share some previous artwork that you have never seen before, rough sketches and stuff, uh, that you can see. Where we did, we, did we start with Avalon in 2015? Well, it started with uh, several maps. And this is one of the first maps that I created, I think, the end of 2015, early 2016. You can see there's already a oh, I'm point. You can see there's already a roller coaster in there with a different layout. Here we have uh, Merlin's Quest, the dark ride. Here is the whole uh, station and storage for uh, Phoenix, the flaming feather, where we are sitting right now, which was just called a hairband, so a tavern. And uh, the boathouse and uh, a drop tower in the middle of a helix that had a different layout than it has today. Of course, there is a budget, but we don't take it too serious at this moment. <laughs> In the end, you have to, and then you have to make choices. So one of the choices was to not do this drop tower right on this position. But as you can see, it was always there. So not those five stones. It was always this uh, uh, drop tower positioned in right into the helix. And what did it look like in the beginning? This is an early sketch from 2015, a bird's eye view. As you can see, we had a different roller coaster. It was hanging underneath the track instead of riding on top of it. And we had this drop tower up there. And this was the start of the flaming feather on a different position. And I wanted to combine it with the station of the boat ride. So it was both a station of the boat ride and uh, the tavern. It was one building. And if we take a closer look, uh, this was the first sketch. It was from November 2015. So the early phase of, of, of Avalon, where you're sitting right now, how it once started. Uh, but due to uh, budget constraints and timing and, and many more reasons, uh, we were not able to do this. Uh, but nevertheless, we put it in a 3D model, for example, with different roller coaster layout. But you can see already uh, the track going around it. Uh, an early version of Merlin's Quest, uh, playing with two towers instead of one. Now we have one tower on top of the, of the dark ride building. Uh, here you can see a part of the flaming feather. So yeah, like the early plans for what it could have been and what it in the end uh, became. But something else that's also part of this plan is 
if you look here, tiny, tiny, tiny thing, and it was uh, the carousel, <coughs> is currently being developed as Jump and Juna. So also that, uh, I think it's called Jump Around from Zamperla, was always part of the plans, uh, the early plans. And you can see the whole setting was a little bit more dark, was more like Morgana inspired. Uh, so we also changed that during the process. It became a little more friendly. So in 2018, we had finally the opening in July uh, of Avalon. And in the early years, uh, until last year, it looked like this. And then in 2019, I started with first sketches. Because we always, always had in mind, okay, uh, Avalon is not complete. We know that. It feels like it's not complete. We spent all the money that we had and a little more uh, on what we could open in 2018. But yeah, in the back of our minds, there was always this desire, the wish to expand Avalon one day. We didn't know when, we didn't know how, but I started just making some rough sketches, rough proposals, of what could the expansion of Avalon, Avalon look like. So for example, uh, what I played with was a small drop tower, because we were still thinking maybe some little more thrill, not too much, but a little bit more thrill, and also a more friendly, uh, friendly, friendly ride. So if I can combine the two in one building, so we have the, the jump around with the horses, and we have a small drop tower, like going out of the roof and falling through the roof again. And we have an operator who can, who can oversee both. Then we have like a minor expansion of Avalon, That's, that could be the start. The budget was pretty tight, so uh, we had to think small. But that was the start of the process. Uh, we also put it in a 3D model and then photoshopped it in the uh, Google Maps. <laughs> Yeah, but that's how it works, you know, you don't always have time to make, we don't have a team of 20, 30 artists who can make beautiful artwork all day long, so sometimes you just choose to do it the, the easy way, you know, quick, fast, uh, but it works, you know, you get, a, you get a sense of, okay, what could this, this area look like? So this was the start, you already see the small uh, drop tower there, well, we ended up with something bigger. And also, very rough sketches for the carousel, this is 2016, it's even... <coughs> October 2016. So already then I had the idea of okay, maybe I should do something with horses because it's like this joke around. Normally it's, it's, it's a frog. I do it with horses and maybe even a unicorn. So that's the first time that the unicorn uh, came up. Um, so yeah, this was part of the original plans for Avalon. You know, it's not that we came up with this afterwards, it was already there in the beginning, but we couldn't do it. And a fun thing is, I, I noticed this yet, yesterday because I forgot about the sketch. I found it again, that already this Morgana like wood carved figure was already part of the plant back then. And now it's on top of Dragon Watch. So a good idea never dies at the Imagineering, it's also a good idea never dies at Toverland. And then in 2019 I picked the idea up and um, I had the idea, okay, maybe don't choose the horses, but try something different, you know, a little more creative. And what if Merlin used his magic? to create a carousel that is made out of kettles, barrels, uh, whatever you name it, even spoons as ears, and, and a horn, and uh, this is like a basket. And so th then I think, okay, that's, that's a great idea. Uh, we can try it out. Well, we got the first prices and we were like, oh, no, <laughs> that's not gonna fit. That's gonna be the most expensive uh, uh, jump around that has ever been built. And uh, no, it's not, it was on the technical side, it was very, uh, very uh, dif uh, difficult to make for some pair and also it was, was couldn't afford it. So okay, we had to go back to the drawing table. Maybe then we do the frogs and just turn them a little bit more into a medieval theme. So give them a helmet, maybe some blankets, and then we get this vibe of, okay, it, it, it could be part of, of Avalon. And also the first time that I made an impression, it's aquarelle, so it's watercolor, of uh, what the building could look like. Well, if you go there today, you will see that the building is pretty similar to the first sketch that I made uh, in 2021. Of course, we ended up with uh, what's currently in development uh, with our new characters, uh, Sparky. <coughs> so there you can see like the involvement of uh, what started, started as a catch and ended up with uh, what we are currently developing. And then in 2020, we had a strategic, strategic session with uh, Jean, the owner, uh, his son, the director, Janou, the, the daughter of the owner, uh, and uh, Peter Cornelius. I think he's part of the group now. There he is. Our, uh, theme park science professor and uh, we had a strategic session with him like we did previously on Magical Valley and, and the first expansion of Avalon 
uh, okay, to figure out, okay, we have these ideas, but what would be wise to do, you know, what's the best way to, to, to develop this area? Um, and then uh, we had some conclusions that we wanted to uh, expand to 2022 or 23. We, not, we, were, we were not sure back then, but it ended up at 23. Uh, and the focus was primarily on ALOS, which is average length of stay. Am I right, Peter? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was like the essence, you know, that's a strategy that we have to follow. Everything we do, we have to put it in a filter and it has to uh, uh, add to the fact that it has to uh, uh, increase the average length of stay. So create dwell time, a reason to stay for the whole family. Not just one big ride. I know everybody wants a dark ride, I see it everywhere. We even want a dark ride, but if we will build one big dark ride, you know, it's like 20 minutes waiting, a ride of five minutes, maybe you do it twice, no, then 10 minutes, and that's it, you know, and then you leave the area. So, no, we have to make a mix of different attractions and uh, experiences to make sure that people will stay longer than just 10 minutes. So, we need a mix of rides and experiences for all ages. And also, uh, it was both advised by Peter, but also a big wish of the owner, uh, Jean Gelesen. Uh, he wanted more color and more happiness in Avon. And I think that's it. So the first challenge for me was not just thinking of, okay, what will these rides look like, but also more color, more happiness. How will I integrate that idea into Avon? Because when we developed uh, Port Lagoon and Avon together, there was always a split between Port Laguna as more the summer style, idyllic, romantic, colorful uh, harbor village. And Avalon was, of course, more the misty, uh, a little bit colorless, uh, medieval area that was totally different in look and feel than uh, Port Laguna. So, how can, I, how can I integrate the wish? It was not a wish, it was more like, you have to do this, <laughs> uh, of, of, of more color, more happiness into Avalon. So I was thinking, okay, how, how, how am I going to do this? You know, how, how is this going to work? And then I was thinking, where are we in the timeline of Avalon? Because that was for me essential. Where are we? Are we, uh, are we at the start of a battle? Are we at the or uh, did we end the battle? Or where are we? You know. And then I came up, okay, the battle is over because Merlin has been revealed. You know, Morgana is locked up in the dungeons. He can transform to a dragon, so he's locked up as a dragon. And Merlin is looking for a, a cure, a, a, like. A, um, a, um, poison to uh, uh, of a potion to, to melt her heart to make her human again so she's locked up you know the danger is over there's no more danger the battle is over so that's already there it's not that that we came up with this but it was already part of the ori original concept and plans for Avalon so there's no more danger so we can there's something to ce celebrate so let's have celebrate like the rebirth of Avalon you know it's the flame and feather setting that we're sitting right now so it was time to celebrate and if you keep that in mind then um, yeah, you are welcome to add a little bit more color, you know, we keep the specific look and feel of Avalon, but we can add some color, so we have the banners, we have the banners on the light fixtures, we have of course the banners underneath Dragon Watch, here we have like a lens with banners and uh, colorful lights, so you get the sense of, okay, this is Avalon, but they have something to celebrate, you know, there's a positive vibe in this area, in this world, because Morgana has been uh, overruled, she is locked up, Merlin is back, the phoenix has risen from its ashes, so everything is good, everything is well, you know, it's, it's a good place to live and to be at. Even Spicy Pete uh, is ready there to, to cook a meal for us, like a, like a, like a celebration, like an overwinning smile. <laughs> and the overall theme for Avalon is resurrection, because when you think about it, the phoenix has just reborn from its ashes, so it gets a second life. Uh, when you go into Merlin's Quest, the idea was always you go to Tiernanog, and Tiernanog is like the well of endless life and, and magic. So you feel like you are reborn when you exit this cave, this, this dark light part, that was always the idea. Uh, so that's like the overall overarching theme for Avalon is uh, the rebirth of life, Avalon, get a second chance. And that's also happening right now in Avalon, you know. They lock Morgana up, the battle is over. Let's celebrate that the phoenix has risen from its ashes, that you feel reborn after visiting the phoenix, uh, Merlin's quest. Uh, and that's like the overall theme for, uh, for Avalon. And then the other um, um, advice that came out of the strategic session with Peter was uh, to get a mix of rights and experiences for all ages. And of course, where to put them? Because first of all, you have to think, what, what do you want to add to the, to the park? But also, where do we put them? So 
I started with the layout of the Avalon area uh, as it was in 2018, 19, 20, 21. And then I played with, okay, where can I position the right? Well, of course, I made several versions, and it is, it's a process, so it's not just one layout and that's it. This process, but what you see here is like the, the end of the process, where, where we have all the, uh, put all the, the, the rights in place. And for me, and for all of us, it was very important to have like a weenie, like a big magnet on the horizon. So when you enter Avalon, you want to pull people all the way into the area, you know, because now, what happened now is that they go to Phoenix, they walk back, and then they go to Merlin's Crest, and they walk back and they leave the area. So many times they don't even pass the flaming feather, they don't even go like this. So okay, we need something in the back that is high, that has volume, that is dynamic, kinetics, and that like attracts you towards the end of, of Avalon, that you want to go there, you want to experience, you want to see what's happening there. So that's why we put Dragon Watch, the parachute tower, all the way in the back. Uh, and also that you have like, this is the centerpiece of the area, you know, the flaming feather was the back of Avalon, and now it's like the centerpiece of a whole new area where the whole family can enjoy the rides and experiences. So that was the main reason to put Dragon Watch there. And Pixaros on the other hand, yeah, the idea was always to put something in the helix, so now was the moment to do it. So this is what Avalon looks like previously, before we started construction. And then we made a, a rough SketchUp model that is evolving throughout the days and the months and the year. Uh, so this is a brief of an early version. You see there's already more detail in there, but it's still pretty rough. With the uh, Dragon Watch, Pixaris, Flaming Feather, of course. The Garden Tour with the Clock Show, Jumping Juna Carousel. Uh, yeah, that gives, gives a sense of what the area could look like, look like. This is also like the base that I used to make the bird's eye view. Of course, you know this bird's eye view by now, I think. So you can see it's pretty similar to the process that you see here. from. You know, the current situation to a rough SketchUp, SketchUp model to, yeah, what it should look like in the end. So I made this last year uh, and it was of course marketing for marketing use but also for ourselves as an inspiration. Okay, now we can see the details come together and what, what's the overall look and feeling of the area. And of course there's two major rides, it's Dragon Watch and Spix Hours. So Pixaris, uh, how did it start? Because when I was thinking about giving this presentation, I can tell you everything about every ride that we are developing, but then I need like three hours. <laughs> <laughs> and I already have one, so I had to make a choice, and I was thinking, okay, Pixaris, I think that's the most interesting for this group to share with you. So how do we start from the very early beginning to where we are right now, which, which is like constructing, uh, construction on, on site? Well, it started for, first with uh, coming up with the ride that was decided in the, the, the session with Peter that we need a frill ride that like fits the gap between like the, fe the spectacular Phoenix and the boat ride Merlin's Quest and we need something in between a little bit closer to Phoenix than to uh, boat ride of course uh, when you look at the spectacle that we have a whole uh, like a scala of rides that, that, that's uh, uh, attractive for our family so then we have the location, of course, and um, the first thing that we came up with was, okay, maybe try this giant wave um, motor. It's called in English. It's like a wind seeker, I think. Uh, uh, what could that look like? You know, it's it's like a camera's a, 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 It's like a fancy fair ride, but maybe we can give it a, a, a makeover to make it look like it fits an apple. So this is the first watercolor study that I did in 2020. What, what if you try this out? And what you can see is, we didn't end up with this right, but you see elements that are currently part of Dragon Watch. So again, the good idea never dies. I even tried it out again, pretty simple in Photoshop, put it in the place in the photo, <laughs> and what may it look like? Because when you're building in, in the Helix, you know, you have a tight space, so you, you have to go up and you, have, you need, you cannot go any wider, so you have to go up. You have to use the height instead of the, the width of the area. Uh, so you come up with a ride that goes up, you know, and also you want this weenie in the landscape. So you want something that attracts attracts people towards uh, a certain direction in the area. I even made a Photoshop. Uh, <laughs> what, what may it look like from, from, from a certain height? So we had a drone. We made some photos of the area on a certain height. It's a different height. 
uh, to give an idea of, okay, what, what if you go up, what, what do you see, what do you get? <laughs> but, okay, that didn't work out. We didn't like it. It was, too, too, it was not the right right on that spot. And then there was the skyfly. And we're thinking, okay, maybe it's going to fit on, the, on, this, on this very tight space. And it's also a really dynamic, uh, unique attraction. Of course, Duinval has one. But if you look at the catchment area of Toverland, where most people come from, they don't come from up in the north of the Netherlands. So uh, uh, most people that come here have never seen a, a skyfly before. So it's a pretty unique ride for most people. Uh, and it's also a pretty thrilling ride for most people, but you can adjust if you want. You know, it's up to you if, how, how thrilling you want it. Uh, it's affordable, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not cheap, it's expensive. <laughs> But not, not as expensive as building like a, a 100 meter high uh, a drop fall tower, for example. Uh, and we can theme it pretty easily. I, I thought I can theme it pretty easily. So. <laughs> it's easier than, than to, uh, to, to, uh, to theme it uh, compared to most real rides. So, so the first thing I did was, okay, I make it look like a ruin. Because well, we already have a ruin of Merlin, so we have a second ruin. So it's like a medieval machine that comes to life. You know, it was once built by Merlin. And uh, one day it, uh, it comes back to life, and then uh, people can experience this. So that was the first start. And then uh, I pre presented this to uh, the board, so the owner and, uh, and the family. And they said, ah, oh, no, not another uh, ruin. Because we already have so many ruins, we have so many stones, and uh, not another ruin. No, no, we're not going to do that. We want, it should be a little bit more vibrant, a little more colorful, uh, a little more uh, friendly. So, okay, there we go again. <laughs> How, uh, I'm going to fit this in the area then. Um, and then I said, okay, what? If it's going to be uh, an area that, that feels alive, that's a little more colorful, that it's not a ruin, so there's life there, there's people working or doing something, why not um, make a school out of it? Because, f first of all, we have to tell people that go on this ride who are not familiar with it how to use it, because you have to use the wings and you have to tell them something, because otherwise they have no clue what to do with it. What, what's going on, going on here? No, yeah. right. So we have to uh, 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 introduce them to, to using this ride. So I think, okay, if we have to introduce them, we have to tell them, we have to learn them something, why not, why not make a school out of it? Because, you know, it makes sense in an area where people live, have a, a tavern, a restaurant, uh, a burden lives there, a wizard lives there, uh, they need a school too to, to, to share the knowledge and uh, uh, wisdom. So. If I make a school out of it, then we have, I think, a setting uh, that fits pretty well with this ride that we can make, uh, give a, this, this Avalon uh, look and feel. And uh, here we can have like students instead of just guests, but we have students coming. And, and those students, they have to be um, introduced into um, like a class, how to use this ride. And then the ride is part of the classes of the school, of the, of the program of the school. So that's, that's a great starting point. And, and then I can make it a little bit more, a little bit more colorful. Uh, I, can, I can play with it. Uh, I came up with the name Pixaris pretty early because Pixaris, of course, reflects to the pixies. They live in Tierna Noch, in uh, Merlin's Quest. And they are like the start of life in Avalon. So they, they, they have this very pure and, and, and authentic feeling and they have some kind of wisdom, I think, that reflects uh, pretty well in the name of Pixaris in the end. And it's all already in the spell. Merlin says, uh, Pixaris, Minevus, Logudus, may the gates to Tirna Noch be open. Now, Pixaris was already part of, 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 his, of his spell, you know, of his, of his uh, 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 text. So I, I use that as, uh, as uh, the name for, uh, for this ride. And from there on, um, oh, I can see what's happening right now, you see. The request was, can you add a little more color? So I said, yeah, maybe we can do it with stucco. So if we add some orange stucco, because orange stucco is already part of the station building for Phoenix. When you go into Phoenix, the ceiling is blue and you see the sky and the walls are orange. So I think that that, that color is already part of, of, of Avalon. I think we can use that as a stucco on the outside of this um, building. And then you have the color and I have a color that fits in uh, the theme already. So we can make it even a little bit more colorful. From, from there on we develop this building. I uh, also did some sketches, rough sketches from the inside. Okay, it's a school, so you have like a big corridor, hallway, where you enter the school and you get a sense, okay, this is a school, so you have lockers, and you have uh, a look on the classroom, and you have like a, a briefing tower where you get instructions because you are ready for a first flight over Avalon. Um, yeah, this, I think we, we, can, we can make a fun and, and exciting place uh, 
of this Pixar school, Flight School of Magic. Of course, you see also things that are similar to the Flaming Feather, for example, like the roof and the shapes of the building and the windows. And there's a lot of similarity with you know, what you're seeing currently here in the Flaming Feather. And then I played with gas flow. How did we get there? Because it's a tight space, you have to go underneath Phoenix. Can we go underneath Phoenix? Because we have these big foundations of the roller coaster. Can we go in between? You know, it's, it's, it was a big puzzle to, uh, to <coughs> figure this out. So this is the first yeah, SketchUp model, and then I just draw over the SketchUp model, just to get a sense of, okay, what's the, the entrance, what's the exit? Do we need an elevator, yes or no? Um, and just trying to figure out if, it, if, if we can make this work, but also, can we make it fit? So, again, in SketchUp, we have the safety envelope of uh, Phoenix. We have the whole track of Phoenix. It was provided by B&M, so we know it should be right. <laughs> <laughs> you have the boat house in the back. This is the Immelman. This is the Zero G roll. Here is the Helix. So now we know, okay, now we can play with this, the volumes. That, that's what you do, play with volumes and try to figure out if we can make this fit, and if we can also create some space for queue lines, operations, technical rooms, uh, uh, and theming, of course. So you see the very rough just columns and, 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 and uh, tubes to play with, to get a sense of, okay, we know it's going to be tight, but how tight is it going to be? Then we tried the safety envelope of uh, Pixaris, the Skyfly. And then you just play with it, you know, how high can we go, how low can we go, how wide can we go, and you just play with it from different angles. And now I do it very quick, but of course we did it very uh, uh, intense uh, and, 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 um, um. and then we went to uh, a little bit more um, detailed 3D model, but still pretty rough. You know, you can see the first towers, like, this, like the pre-show tower the main column, uh, maybe some operator rooms. And we also lifted it up a little bit more to see if it works. Also checking out the, the side lines from different angles, if we like it or not. So this is, I think, the view from the terraces right here on the left. So when you, you, when you exit the Flaming Feather, you go to the left, you have these terraces, which, which used to be pretty quiet. But I think now with Pixaris, the addition of Pixaris, people will stay there because not everybody will do this right. So they have to wait. So they will wait on that part of the terraces. Um, and this is a view from these terraces. So now we know it's going to fit. Um, we have the volume. And I used the volume in SketchUp as the basis uh, to play with. So I drew over the volumes. And I just drew the indication of a helix. And OK, what, what will this building look like? And it has to look like Avalon. It has to be a little bit more colorful. It has to have this. Uh, sense that it's, it could be a school, you know, it is a, it's a, middle, a little bit uh, chic, as we say in Dutch. Um, uh, it should be impressive, we have to go up in, in height, and the first idea was that you go up by stairs. So now we have like this walkway going around the, like the, the rock work and the building, but we started with stairs. <coughs> so there you also see this, there are some changes. And I always want to have these green roofs, like we have in the Flaming Feather. But the slope was too, uh, it's too steep, and it was a little bit too expensive. So uh, <laughs> we uh, we changed that to uh, to straw. This was also a first idea for the operator room. So it was like a, a room, like a broken tower. And this is a, a, another view of this building. So you see the, the yeah, not not that much has changed. Especially this building is still the same. We did some minor adjustments, but I think in general. It's uh, 85, 90 percent is still relevant what you see here. So this is the backside of the building. When you leave the boathouse, this is what you will see. I tried to spy around, but <laughs> it was like two meters inside the safety envelope of Skyfly. So uh, <laughs> that's not gonna fit. <laughs> and then we also put it in a 3D model, and you see it's it's like a combination of drawing and 3D models and AutoCAD and uh, especially the 3D models. We work a lot of with with 3D. Sometimes we do maquettes, like physical maquettes, but ma mainly we do uh, uh, SketchUp, uh, ZBrushing, uh, different programs uh, to get a sense of, okay, is it going to fit? What's it going to look like from different angles? What kind of materials do we use? So we have wood, we have concrete, we have, no, steel is just wide here, but it gives an illusion or a suggestion of what, uh, what that is. 
We even see the spire here of Dragon Watch. So that's going to be seen from a distance. And from there, we're just playing with the 3D model. So this is still the early version with the stairs, seeing from above. And this is the safety envelope of, uh, of uh, Phoenix. And then you, you move up and down between uh, the drawing, drawing board to the computer, uh, to the uh, con construction designer slash engineer. And what we do is going up and forth. And for example, this is SketchUp model. And then I or my, one of my colleagues draw over it to tell, no, we want to move a little, little bit more like this because we want to have this exit. And it should be round because everything is round in Avalon. The window is round. Uh, we work with round shapes. So then you draw this and it goes back to the SketchUp model and they adjust it. So that you have like this this model in the end that um, yeah, fits pretty well in the design uh, that you have in mind. And then uh, this is the final SketchUp model, I think. This is section cut. So if you cut the model in two, this is what you will see when you look inside. So you have the operator room, you have the like the uh, pre-show, uh, pre-seating room, and this is part of the classroom hallway. This is the hill that is built on, where it is built on top. This is the tunnel that is the entrance to the attraction. And here we have a, a separate um, a space that is a technical room for a show, show control and, and DMX and whatever we need. Hydraulics, I think. Uh, and of course, the operator room. And then many, many, many technical drawings, construction drawings are made. This is one of a big map with full of, of drawings. Uh, you know, with layouts, different levels of layouts, different um, elevated views on the building. So a side view, a front view. And this is like the, the underlayer that we used to make the final drawing. And this was drawn by Kuhn, my colleague, he's sitting somewhere over here, uh, uh, to give the sense, okay, what should the final look be like? And sometimes you also have to compromise. For example, this lower part, we want to, to, to yeah, spray it with spray concrete and then carve beautiful shapes. But we went over budget with that, so then you have to choose. You know, you cannot do it all. If you buy a car, you want the most expensive version, but sometimes you have to choose. So we also have to choose. So then we came up with the idea, okay, what if we let uh, Klimmel, so uh, plants grow. Uh, it will take some time, we know that. Then we can cover up the lowest part of this hill and then we don't have to cover it with spray concrete, so we save a lot of money and we can spend the money somewhere else. Or there's no more money to spend, that's what I hear now. <laughs> so uh, we have to save something. So that's, that's also how you play with budget. You know, you, you want to do it all, you have to make choices, and then you think, okay, how can I make these choices? And I think in the end, it will look even better, because when you have this like greeny hill with this building site uh, on top, then it's even a better combination than just all rock work. So in the end, it will even look better. And from there on, we also make lighting plans. So uh, it's not just uh, do the whole theming and construction, and, but also uh, incorporate light, uh, audio, speakers, cameras, uh, special effects. We all do it in our own little team. So it's not that we have something, someone to do that for us. We all do it ourselves. And of course, from there, it moves to a supplier that can supply the light fixtures, the cables, uh, you name it. So what I did was using the SketchUp model and just uh, adding some beams and lights to give a sense, okay, how can we light this building during uh, the darker moments of the day, especially during the winter times. And we also make plans, I did it with Eveke maybe, uh, where do we put all these lights and how many lights do we have and are they like warm white or RGB, so colored, are they uh, adjustable or just on and off, uh, how many do we need? Where do we position them? And for each and every part of the area, each and every building, each and every section, and each and every wall, we make these drawings. So we have like a booklet with tens of these pages with all the light fixtures. We have a separate book with all the audio speakers, with all the effects. I'm not going to share it with you <laughs> because then I, I, I give away too much. But then you realize it's not just, okay, make beautiful drawings, you have a facade. No, it's also thinking about these things and also thinking about, okay, we have a light fixture. How can we incorporate that into the theme? So you have to work together. You know, you have to think about dimensions. Will the lamps fit? For example, we had lamps in mind that didn't fit. So now we had to find different lamps because it didn't, it didn't fit in the, like the opening that they made in the spray concrete. So it's also always uh, uh, improvising and adjusting. 
And then of course you have to design the ride itself. So the overall design for Pixaris um, was this. I think this is the second or third version that I did. Because for me it was, I think, the hardest ride that I ever had to design, ever. Because when I did Phoenix, um, I had the idea of okay, making a bird and, and, and we can make it, we can work around this train. With, for example, Blitzbahn, it was pretty easy because you can make a steampunk thing out of it. But this ride, somehow, you are really limited in what you can do because you cannot add too much weight, you cannot go further away from the whole arm, uh, you cannot do much with the vehicles, there's not much space in between, so you cannot have, have, cannot have a lot of additions to it because everything is very limited. Uh, of course, the budget is also limited, so you cannot do everything you want. So it, it was for me a big challenge to, to incorporate this right into the, the, the environment um, and adding stuff. But again, I think we succeeded in this. So this is the, the ID, you know, with the big amulet in the middle, which is part of the um, grace of uh, Merlin. It's a symbol that repeats throughout the, uh, the area. We have a big kettle on the other side, uh, which says this is a school of magic. You know, it's, like, it's more like, almost like a billboard for the school. Uh, and also a counterweight, counterweight uh, function it has. And uh, from there on, I had to make a lot of drawings together with my colleagues for all the details because to, to get Gerslauer on the same page as we did and to, to, to make sure that somewhere far, far away in Germany they will make it the way we envisioned it. So there were made a lot of uh, details designs like this to, to get the right uh, feel, color, texture, uh, whatever you need to make this arm stand out and this attraction stand out of the others. So for example, this is what we shared with the colors, textures, uh, references. For example, this is a reference here in the Filling the Feather. Do you think it's this far? <laughs> so to give them the idea, you have to imagine 500 kilometers away from here, some painter, a painter is, is working on this. He has never seen the Filling Feather, so he has no idea what you're talking about. So you have to incorporate all of these specific details into the design process. <coughs> You can see it's from October last year, so it's pretty fresh. Uh, Patrick, my colleague, did the design uh, for, the, for the cattle. Also thinking about not just drawing a cattle, but also thinking about, okay, how can we open this? Because there's a light, and when the light is damaged or broken, you have to replace it. You cannot replace it by hand because you cannot climb on top, so you, first you need a, a, a crane or something to get there. But when you get there, you have to open it. So you also think about how can we open this uh, so it's, it's for maintenance. Uh, you also made a, a more detailed design of the, the big seal that is in the middle, which is like a symbol that is uh, reflecting the look and feel of Avalon. Also with a section <coughs> cut and uh, different uh, uh, what, what to do and what not to do with carving. And from there uh, I made a more specific detailed design based on a rough, yeah, um, a uh, um, uh, model um, to give it a specific look with the colors, brass color, old gold, and also you know give the texture again of the. It's like you know it's this big steel machine, but you want to make it look like it's medieval, so it has to look like it has been made of planks, you know. Uh, and of course, everything in Avalon has this warm color, this gradient going outwards. So you have like a vanishing point here, and from there it goes out. The whole idea of that is that it's more the symbolism behind Avalon. That is, you know, Merlin represents the warm, the warmth of, of the good side of magic. So he's the positive wizard, of course. He has been Mer Morgana. So he represents, he represents uh, warmth and, and kindness. The phoenix, on the other hand, is also representing this because it's about the flames of the phoenix, the, the, the warmth that he represents. So this warm feeling and this warm part of magic is like uh, the essence of Avalon. And you want to put that essence and that feeling in everything that you do. So, for example, here it is in the flaming feather. We have the flaming feather up there in the, in the in this, uh, part. And we also want to incorporate that in the, in the right arm. So that's what we did with all the designs. Uh, I made a design for the vehicle, the gondola, they call it at uh, Gerslauer. Um, and I always had in mind, okay, it's not going to be a real uh, flying machine because 
even we as Avalon people and Merlin know that this is a machine, you know, and I want to make it look like a machine. I don't want to make this look like uh, living animals. I don't want to make this look like um, um, uh, how do you call it? Um, uh, airplanes that fly through the air without being attached to an arm. You can see the arm, the arm is part of it. So it's more like a, a medieval uh, simulator um, than it is a real flight. So if, okay, if we um, look at it as a, a simulator, then it may look like a simulator, but then medieval style, you know, made in medieval times by Merlin. So I make this look like a medieval sim simulator, but it has, it reflects the name Pixie because it has this almost like Pixie wings, that's how it started. Um, then I, I, I incorporate all these ideas and I played with back, you know, maybe I, I, can, I can play a little bit with it to make it more look like a medieval machine, maybe with some heat going uh, like an exhaust on the outside. That you get more, more like a jet engine, but then a medieval jet engine powered by uh, this liquid. It's like a, a, like a dust, a dragon dust, or pixie dust, or something that, like that. And also these extra wings. Uh, we know this had to be printed because we cannot shape on the wings, so this is going to be a print. But maybe we can do this as a real physical 3D wings. Well, they started big and they ended up a little smaller because the limited space again that we had. Um, I also was thinking about, okay, this is removable, so I, I am going to uh, make a drawing of that too, that, that, you, that they can see in Germany that I see this as one big part that you can take off. Well, in the end, it's a little different, but you know, it's, it's a process that you go uh, in together to find out how, how, how we are going to make this work. Not, not only look at, make it look good, but also uh, uh, make it look good for maintenance purpose for uh, uh, um, the people that have to work with this ride. And my uh, colleague uh, uh, Patrick did uh, uh, several uh, versions of, of, of the, the rear side, the rear cover of the vehicle with the wings, because we had to adjust the wings. I think ten times, Patrick. <laughs> uh, many, many versions. Many. Yeah, 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 yeah. Then this was too big. Then that was too big. Then we, they could not do this, and then they could not do that. Of course, they could, but then they needed more time and more money, and we didn't have more time, and we didn't have more money. So. Yeah, you have to find a solution. So there were done many revisions of this model, many more than you would ever imagine, to to get to still have, you know, respect the idea and the design, but to make it fit in budget, in time, and especially in the space, that, limited space that we have up there. But we ended up with uh, this. I think the final version. It was 3D printed, so it was not shaped, but it was really uh, 3D printed this time. That's, I think that's the first for us too. And from there on, uh, I went to the wing design. So you have the wings, and I knew it was going to be a sticker. So this is like the outline that you get from Gaslauer with some dimensions. And uh, good luck, start with it. And uh, I hope to get the, the print by at the end of next week. Uh, well, it was a rush. <laughs> I remember on the, on the deadline, the day of the deadline, I worked till like 9 or 10 in the evening to make it, uh, to get it ready, because it was a high resolution uh, drawing, drawn on the iPad Pro, for uh, everybody wants to know. Um, and uh, that be printed uh, the next week so it could be incorporated on time. And this is like the final version that I delivered. Of course, like this is cut off, so that's, that's what you won't see. And I made three versions uh, a green one, a red one, and a blue one. And uh, these are also the, the three primary colors of the area. I'm uh, finishing in like five minutes. <laughs> We're going towards the end. If you're talking about details, I even made uh, drawings for rivets, you know, uh, in, the, in the, not klingnagels, nagels in Dutch. Um, so uh, the rivets that are also stickers, which are also incorporated into the uh, vehicle. So even for that small detail, uh, I made three or four different designs that they can play with when attaching the stickers to the vehicle. And there also was feedback around, so it's not just, okay, here you have the drawing, success, you will see it when it comes up uh, on, on site. But you give feedback. So this um, February the 26th, so it's not, not that long time ago. This was like a, a sample for uh, what the arm of the, rib, the vehicle of the right could look like. And then I give some feedback and I incorporate that feedback into this drawing. So maybe you don't see it, maybe you do, but there are some differences. And this is what you send up and down to get, uh, get them into the right direction. The same with, uh, for example, the rear cover of the gondola. This is what we got and this is my feedback. You know, even examples of what a wooden beam uh, should look like and then incorporate these details into the paintwork and they move up and down every time. So it's not just, okay, 
you have a problem, good luck. No, you, you get emails like every day or every two days. You try to respond as quick as you can, and from there it moves up and down towards the final version. Uh, for example, also a factory test of the backside of the engine. And then I incorporated some details like uh, uh, suit, which is good. And also the idea of uh, coal that's burning still there. And then, yeah, this is from the on-ride movie that we just released last week, I think, where you can see a bit of the effect that I had in mind. And it's even like glowing. So you have the, this really medieval style machine that you are uh, uh, controlling at the moment when you are uh, part of the ride. And this is how uh, we uh, created Pixaris in a nutshell, because this is just maybe 10% of the drawings that we made. So we went from the first sketch to the first test run. And uh, the next step is, I think, trying it out ourselves. <laughs> and I cannot tell you when. <laughs> and that's it, the final bird's eye view. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention. So, wir haben jetzt gerade ein bisschen was ähm, ja, zu dem neuen Bereich gehört, beziehungsweise zu der Erweiterung von Avalon. Sehr interessant ist, ähm, ja, dass das, was halt jetzt umgesetzt wird, damals schon vor der Eröffnung von Avalon, damals schon im Plan halt drin war, wusste ich so noch nicht. Es war eine andere Form, es war halt ein, erstmal ein anderer Drop Tower da irgendwie äh, geplant, dann war halt äh, ein hohes Kettenkarussell geplant, aber dass halt solche neuen Attraktionen noch zu Avalon gehören, um, das war halt eigentlich schon der Ursprungsplan von, vom Toverland. Und ich finde es halt ganz cool, dass man halt so jetzt im zweiten Bauabschnitt, jetzt wo halt Avalon schon so ein bisschen gefertigt war und halt auch die Achterbahn halt schon einen Stellenwert in Europa hat, dass man dann nochmal hingeht und den Bereich dann nochmal erweitert, um halt vier neue Attraktionen, um die es jetzt hier halt geht. Toverland hat ja schon diese äh, Attraktion schon vor längerer Zeit ähm, ja, veröffentlicht oder bekannt gegeben, dass diese gebaut werden. Dazu gab es bei mir hier auf dem Kanal halt auch schon ein Ankündigungsvideo, ist jetzt hier nochmal verlinkt. Aber zu dem, was hier von diesen vier Attraktionen gebaut wird, wurde in den letzten Wochen und Monaten immer noch mehr ähm, noch dazu, kam da immer noch mehr dazu, wie zum Beispiel ähm, ja, eine kleine Show und so weiter. Und es ist halt ja, ein rundes Bild, dass man halt in einem Jahr auf einmal so viel an neuen äh, Attraktionen und Möglichkeiten hat, hier dann in Avalon zu ähm, verweilen. Wir haben das jetzt hier gerade uns angeguckt. Auf der anderen Seite gibt es halt so ein paar 3D-Modelle ähm, von Figuren, die man halt rausgedruckt hat ähm, mit einem 3D-Drucker. Die werden halt so auch äh, hier und da in Avalon bald zu sehen sein. Wie gesagt, da gibt es ja halt auch noch so eine kleine Show und sowas, was hier auch noch folgen wird, neben diesen Attraktionen. Und ja, wir sind jetzt hier erstmal fertig. Jeder geht nochmal auf den Klo. Wir trinken unseren Kaffee leer und dann geht's zur Baustelle. Als erstes geht es hier zur Baustelle von Pixarus. Also wir werden uns die ganze Baustelle angucken von jeder Attraktion. Und ähm, ja, wir stehen jetzt hier gerade praktisch ähm, vor Pixarus oder neben Pixarus. Und ähm, das Krasse daran ist halt, dass es halt in, der, in die Helix reingebaut ist von Phoenix. Und ja, wir haben gerade eben im Vortrag gehört, dass es halt an der engsten Stelle 20 cm halt sind. Ähm, an Abstand zu der Schiene. Und das ist halt schon sehr, sehr krass. Äh, wurde halt auch natürlich gefragt, natürlich ist es halt alles TÜV geprüft. Es wird, ist natürlich abgenommen, sonst könnte man sowas überhaupt gar nicht bauen. Aber es ist dann halt schon sehr eng, besonders wenn man halt überlegt, die Schiene ist ja nach innen gebogen praktisch. Und ähm, ja, es ist halt eine Helix und man fährt halt dann halt innen ganz, ganz dicht ähm, an Pixarus dann halt vorbei. Und äh, Pixarus hat auch noch eine Besonderheit, äh, der Skyfly von ähm, Gerstlauer normalerweise. Ähm, fährt nämlich Pixarus bei den anderen Freizeitparks, wo so eine Attraktion halt steht, immer eine in die andere Richtung. Ähm, hier ist es jetzt erstmal so, dass es halt, ähm, ja, 
die Attraktion so fährt, dass halt praktisch ähm, die Achterbahn praktisch mit dieser Attraktion kreuzen kann. Normalerweise wäre es halt richtig rum, dann würde die Attraktion genauso fahren, so wie dann halt auch Phoenix hier vorbeifährt. Aber damit, damit man halt diese, diesen Kreuzeffekt hat, ist es halt so, dass es jetzt zum ersten Mal so gebaut wird, dass halt ja, so ein Skyfly andersrum ähm, fährt als üblich. Und äh, ganz interessant war halt, dass halt das erste Modell, äh, dieses Prototypmodell, das man damals hatte bei Gerstauer, genau so rum ähm, dann fahren sollte. Und man hat sich dann halt, oder die anderen Parks haben sich dann immer dafür entschieden, das andersrum zu bauen. Ich muss jetzt selber nachher mal gucken, wie rum es überhaupt ist. Ich glaube, ja, wenn man davor steht, dann halt links rum. Normalerweise dreht es sich rechts rum. Jetzt ist es aber hier links rum und das ist dann halt auch noch eine Besonderheit. Ist halt unique auf der Welt. Gibt ja bisher nur ähm, Pixaros mit dieser Drehung. Ja, jetzt kommt gerade Phoenix wieder vorbei und dann kann man hier gleich mal gucken, auch wie knapp das hier an dem Haushalt ist, wie knapp ähm, ist dann vorbei. Ja, also es ist halt schon, da hat man halt auf jeden Fall einen sehr coolen nirnes effekt we are now standing in front of the tunnel, which is the access point for Pixaris. The thing is that this is the only access point that we have to get into the helix of the coaster because of the food or something. Um, what makes it a bit special is that we have to had to dig around the food of Phoenix, which of course was quite a challenge. And that's also the reason why Phoenix had to be closed for such a long time. So what we are going to do next is that we are going to split the group in two and Kun and I will take one group upstairs, the other group will wait down here. We'll take a look, you guys can take a look at the Xeris, have the chance to also get to the closest point of the safety envelope of Phoenix. Hopefully it will come around and you can also get some nice shots there. Careful on the this. <laughs> you want to wait there? I like the funnels part. <laughs> <laughs> So here at the pavement you can already see that we have some holes placed there, that's where the future fencing will be. So in the end, this part of the hill will be the exit and this part of the hill will be the entrance, which is, which is quite small, but since the attraction has a lower capacity, we figured that it would be better to do it this way. Also you have to queue on the outer side of the, uh, of the circle, so to speak. That means you're closest to Phoenix when waiting. This is also one of the closest parts that we get to the safety envelope of the ride. So I think it's quite nice for you guys to wait here till Phoenix come around so that you can really get a sense of how close we're getting to this. Filling out of steel that is also very uh, transparent. So yeah, we thought it's very important that when you come so close to the coaster that it's so nice that you can also really see the, the emotion on the people's faces, for example, and that you, for example, can put a camera uh, through. But yeah, you also have a lot of, um, um, I have to say, restraints on the size of the openings. For example, uh, Tooth uh, sometimes uh, calculates with, um, when you have a, an, a, a guest with an umbrella, um, they shouldn't be able to stick the umbrella through an opening, because uh, this is so close to the, to the safety envelope that that would then be in the safety envelope. So a lot of those kind of considerations, it's very nice that we have so close contact with them, because yeah, it's, it's sometimes insane what you have to think about uh, to keep everything safe. Um, but yeah, they also realize why we wanted, why we wanted to do this. So they help us a lot with advices on, on those kind of things. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's now a bit hard maybe to see through this, but you will in the end have much more view on, on the coaster. Um, Blackfall that we have on here is 
uh, mainly because of yeah, we're still constructing here, so any debris of material we had to make sure that nothing can fall through, because at this point we are opening uh, Phoenix in the afternoons. Next week it will be completely closed because we have to have some works on the outside. But in the afternoons it will be open and we will be working here. So this is a way that we could make sure, well, we can have Phoenix running and we can work on the construction site and keep it safe for everybody. Um, and also, of course, yeah, keep our guests happy because Phoenix is one of our biggest rides which should be coming around now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the, the only part of this wall that's not done yet is, is above this roof, simply because it wasn't safe to work there while the coaster was running. <laughs> so that's those kind of things that they can only do uh, when the coaster is closed. So as Robert told you, um, the entrance, let's say the queue is on the outside, so that leads directly into our show building, is how we call it, um, which Peter showed some uh, sketches of. Um, and we want to keep a bit of a surprise on how this exactly looks, um, but you will already see quite a good, yeah, you will get, get quite a good look on how, how big the space is and uh, how sort of uh, cozy it still feels, while it's of course quite a huge building. Yeah, we do have to be careful now a bit because the spray concrete works, they are working here today. They're now for a coffee break, but yeah. it's a bit messy everywhere, <laughs> so be careful where you stand yeah. and mind your head. function for the building people as a nice shelter <laughs> when they have to cut the wood for example. Um, it, it's not really clean up but you see, you see for example the, the cutting machines, uh, they conveniently located them inside the buildings now. <laughs> uh, this is quite a funny thing that you can see now and that you will never see again I feel like. Um, uh, this will be themed as um, kind of as it, as, a, as a sort of as a, as a joke that it is the tower that you see from the outside yeah. and when it's finished we believe that that will really be the experience because you have no connection to where the tower really is so it, it should feel oh like yeah, this is the yeah. tower um, but it basically is a hollow space because underneath as Peter told you in the presentation is the technical room um, which should be accessible and uh, um, preferably accessible while the ride is operating so um, we were able to make the technical room over there connect to the one here where, um, yeah, let's say technical employees can, can work or check while the attraction is open without having to bother people waiting or people in the attraction. It's an optical illusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then when you spend a lot of time waiting for the ride and get excited, you will enter here into the group of town. Well, you will be placed to sit before enjoying the ride. And even this building, we wanted to give it Something majestic. It's kind of screw you're going on a flight. So here there will also be a show while you're stand waiting excited for your for your ride on Pixaris. Yeah and of course we, we had this 3D model so we were basically before starting to build able to um, to stand everywhere in the project and see what the new sort of sidelines would be. Um, but I have to say the first time that we were able to access this platform here, it was really a positive surprise to see, for example, how nice now you can see the station of Phoenix. And also um, when we walk a bit further, you will be able to see uh, the whole new area quite from above. Um, you can see the boats on the lake. It's, it's really a new experience uh, of Avalon that you only got from the coaster from up high. 
Um, but yeah, yeah, we believe it's quite a quite an impressive new uh, view. Also here, the, these sides will be open. Um, there will be some uh, show elements uh, kind of uh, above you, but you will be able to uh, to take some nice photos while waiting for the exactly. um, It's a little bit hard to uh, see, but um, the attraction now is in the upper position and it will start turning um, this way, so it will really fly above the queue line. Um, so also when you're on the, on the uh, slope up in the queue line, you will see the people in Pixar's already fly over you, which of course builds excitement and uh, yeah, it's really an impressive. So now uh, we're going to walk a bit on below the attraction itself. Be mindful of your head. Then we uh, talk about how to, for example, create a big um, chimney like that. And now you see, for example, the steel that's, that's basically all, all the company that's working now needs to, to create a chimney like this. So it's really nice. Um, we also work a lot with real wood, uh, and the wood will always be connected with this concrete. So, for example, the, the small steel bar there is placed there to be able to create um, connections with the real wood that then can be covered in the concrete. It's quite a tricky process. Um, but yeah, that's why it's so nice that we create these 3D models where you can basically see every connection and stuff like that. Then we have a, a house like this and it's, it's quite a nice one um, to see happen now because you already see, for example, the shapes of the rocks uh, being created in the steel. And yeah, now you can also already look inside the building. Still a little bit a secret, of course, uh, what you will see, but... Uh. <laughs> These rocks are going to be on the other side, where there's already a hole, and there uh, is uh, going to be a statue of Morgana. Uh, and uh, that statue that reminds the people who live here of the dark, the dark ages, when Morgana was the ruler of... Um, of Avalon and uh, people pray for her that one day she will melt down her heart and become human again. So there you can find the statue of Morgana. This is the creature's cottage where all the, yeah, the, the little creatures live. 
I don't know if we have a uh, picture. Don't so. I don't think so. Uh, where we walk past by, there is going to be a blacksmith. Uh, and on that side, there is going to be the books and the spells house. And all these uh, houses, they have an interaction, uh, interactive elements. Uh, to, uh, for example, uh, with this cottage, uh, you will get a horn on the outside. And if you yell or blow into the horn, some uh, a, a very angry toad is going to wake up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's also very great. You see there the construction of the chimney. Uh, a very big dragon is going to look through the chimney and you will see his head popping out of it. Um, more interactive elements here. Pixies are going to crawl Yeah, yeah of course we, um, we had to um, think about, okay, we want to have that, yeah, to create this more lively uh, environment because there's of course a lot of creatures and um, even Merlin, they, they live in this area. So we had the choice, okay, what, what kind of creatures are that? Um, and uh, as you can see here, for example, the, the blacksmith, um, yeah, it's really this, this sort of same creature as you already uh, meet in Merlin's Quest, for example. Um, but we also took the freedom to, to think about, uh, okay, wh what else would, would fit in Avalon? So, uh, of course, the dragons. Uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, the <coughs> dragon that's kind of stuck in this chimney, um, we try to re really make him look uh, kind of like a silly creature that, that wouldn't realize that it was a bad idea to stick his long neck into, um, into the chimney. So also um, inside the house, house you will see his back uh, kind of like being stuck. Um, also the pixies of course. Um, um, a, a little secret is that we um, will have um, uh, baby pixies playing around in these houses like uh, uh, rocking on the on the chandelier on the on the on the ceiling and knocking over stuff um, yeah there's a lot of uh, moving moving effects in these uh, houses um, but yeah that's also for example why um, the um, the floor is a bit higher because you need a lot of technical things to go into these moving um, yeah, moving figures and also again um, they need to be very accessible for our technical people to fix them when they're broken um, so yeah, there's a lot of thought about for example this house it's quite long till the back um, but basically half of the building in the end will be uh, a technical room where all these um, yeah um, animatronics um, are sort of how to say the tech technology is for them to be able to move the way we want them <coughs> Yeah. And in that house, the, the story is that uh, Merlin, oh yeah, it's, it's the book and spell house. Of course, Merlin visits that very often. Uh, and there is the spell keeper. Uh, he also uh, yeah, resembles uh, the people who are already in Merlin's quest. Uh, and they are playing a uh, chess together. And on the outside of the cottage, you will have a, uh, ooh, how is it called in English? Sandloper. Our, our, our glass. glass. Thank you. An hourglass. <laughs> and when you spin it, uh, the time will move forward or the time will go backwards. But still, uh, every time another element will happen. So uh, maybe the books, they fall down or they stand up again. Or uh, one of the books has pages who can turn. Oh, no, uh, there's going to be uh, writing in yes. the book and mm -hmm. uh, unwritten and yeah, a lot of things going on. Yeah, it's our own uh, fairy tale lane, I think. Yeah, yeah, and we, yeah. we um, spent a lot of time thinking about um, that these effects, for example, with the turning hourglass, um, uh, that it's very uh, nice for the children that don't think about storyline or, okay, what do, I, what do I actually represent by turning an hourglass? But that in the same time, um, there is this kind of logical thing that happens. Also, for example, by screaming into a horn, waking up a, a kind of a grumpy creature. Um, it's, it's a funny thing to do for the children, but it also in the same time is kind of a logical thing that will happen when you do something like that. Okay, let's move forward. Ja, ihr habt es gerade gehört, ähm, wir waren jetzt gerade hier vorne an dem Weg von Flaming Feather, ähm, diesen Rundweg, den man halt machen kann, äh, zu Merlin's Quest und ähm, ja, da wird auch noch einiges passieren. Wir sind hier gerade übrigens äh, komplett backstage hinter dem Flaming Feather und ähm, ja, ist auch sehr interessant, was da halt dann noch gebaut wird. Da gibt es halt dann nachher so kleine Häuser äh, mit einigen Animatronics, da wird halt noch gebaut, es wird halt auch noch von Morgana eine Statur gebaut und äh, ja, auf jeden Fall gibt es da halt noch so ein paar interaktive Elemente, die man dann halt irgendwie aktivieren kann und ähm, man, man sieht halt, es sind halt nicht nur diese vier Attraktionen nur wirklich in Anführungszeichen gesetzt, weil das halt auch schon 
sehr, sehr viel ist, sondern ähm, ja, man wertet diesen ganzen Bereich nochmal auf und da kann man sich wirklich auf einiges freuen. Um, but it was very important for us to still make it look Avalon, um, because it would be very visible from the path that's going to be around the garden tour. Um, so it's really like this, uh, yeah, we as a design department only needed to make a quick sketch of how we envisioned it and, and uh, it's very nice to see that it's uh, starting to look a lot like really an Avalon building, um, while in fact it really is just a technical room. Was it we thought it was very important that people um, can also just hang around and take in the atmosphere in a nice way. And we of course already had a terrace here, um, but there was not a lot of shade and not a lot of things happening around. Um, with adding these attractions, we um, really thought the middle of that uh, square would be a very nice place to have benches to uh, picnic. Um, yeah, and also look at the show that's going to happen in the park, for example. Um, and we also enlarged the terrace of the Baby Feather a bit on this side because we realized that this is really going to be the side where the people would, would like to be sitting uh, and see their children play. So you also see the existing playground that we had. Uh, we of course wanted to, to keep it. We gave it a, a more central location, also closer to the restaurant. And opening up this, yeah, this whole square for a, for a place where people can also freely, freely sit and enjoy it. On the right you see the Little Dragons uh, playground, this is of course a playground for really the smallest. Uh, very safe, very close to the toilet and, and to the changing room, uh, convenient for parents. <laughs> and there's another one. Uh, and um, yeah, as you see in the render, you can also You have a lot of the, the, the concrete flooring, um, because we um, also wanted to have a bit of diversity in that. Um, we thought a lot about, okay, how can we accentuate, for example, places where you can sit? So um, there's different materials for, let's say, the square. Then you have the, the path where, where it's most convenient to walk, which is a different material. And then when you get more to the sides, where there are the benches to sit, that's again a different material. Um, you already see the first terrace being uh, created with the flagstone material. Um, yeah, it's something uh, again quite new for Avalon um, because we only had two materials, let's say, and now, um, yeah, it was an idea to uh, okay, what 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 else belongs here and what else we could make fit in, into this medieval time of Avalon. We took a bit of the lake away to create land for the new attractions. But um, it, it's a little bit hard to say what it exactly is, but we feel like now we created this queue line here, you um, see the lake much more and you really experience this, this nature much more around the park, which is also kind of an unexpected nice surprise. A little uh, funny thing to know is that, of course, the witch's forest is happening in this uh, <laughs> forest. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's visible. Halloween. <laughs> people appoint them to seats before they will enter the ride eventually.
And also, this of course gets a whole painting and decoration still. And as you can see on the floor, there's now this black powder on it because the concrete has been part of the Thursday. So it's still something with what we are in the stone. And, uh, Ben Robert. Hi. Ich stehe jetzt hier vor Jumping Juna, das ist das kleine Kinderkarussell mit zwei neuen Charakteren. Es gibt einmal ein Einhorn und einen Drachen, auf die man hier dann halt rumjumpen kann. Es ist halt wirklich ein Kinderkarussell, es gibt halt ja, zwei Attraktionen für, ich glaube, auch für Erwachsene und dann gibt es halt zwei ähm, kleinere Attraktionen, einmal hier Jumping Juna praktisch und dann gibt es halt noch eine kleine Themenfahrt, ähm, auch für die Kleinen. Aber ich finde das sehr schön schon, ähm, Tasta sagte gerade eben, man wollte hier halt noch ein bisschen mehr Farbe reinbringen in den ganzen Themenbereich. Und man sieht halt hier jetzt auch schon mal an den Fenstern oben, ähm, dass da halt schon viel mit Farbe gearbeitet wird. Aber wenn dann nachher auch nachher die ähm, ja, Gondeln drin sind, die sind natürlich auch noch äh, sehr farbenfroh. Und dann gibt es halt nochmal noch mal einen besonderen Touch. Davor äh, waren wir jetzt hier gerade in äh, dem Wartebereich von äh, Dragonwacht. Das ist halt praktisch ja, den Turm, den ihr da oben halt noch seht. Ähm, bis auf Paris ist es halt ja, die einzige Attraktion dieser Art, soweit ich weiß, äh, in Europa. Äh, in den Walt Disney Studios steht halt so ein Tower halt auch. Aber bei weitem nicht so toll thematisiert wie jetzt. Gut, es ist jetzt noch nicht fertig, aber die Spitze, ähm, die da oben drauf installiert worden ist, die sieht schon richtig Hammer aus. Und auch was man hier schon erahnen kann von der Warteschlange ist halt auch viel besser als in diesem Toy Story Land in den Walt Disney Studios. Und das ist jetzt kein Tower. Ähm, wo ihr jetzt Angst haben müsstet vorher, das ist jetzt kein Freefall-Element, sondern man fällt halt schon so ein bisschen, aber man sitzt halt in so Gondeln und das geht halt immer so rauf und runter und ist halt was für die ganze Familie. Man muss wahrscheinlich ein bisschen schwindelfrei sein, um überhaupt einsteigen zu wollen, aber das ist auch sehr, sehr schön integriert, besonders wenn man halt in Avalon hier reinkommt und von Weitem aus dann halt schon diesen Tower halt sieht, äh, macht das halt auf jeden Fall schon ein richtig schönes Bild. Ich stehe jetzt nochmal hier, wo dann äh, Jumping Juna aufgebaut wird. Das wäre praktisch hier. Also hier ist nachher das Karussell beheimatet. Und ja, ähm, hier ist dann halt auch so das Fackerhäuschen. Ne? Also da steht dann der Mitarbeiter drin und bedient das Ganze. Und ähm, ja, ich wollte euch noch mal ein bisschen was zu der Farbenfrohheit hier bei diesem Ride erzählen. Denn äh, man sieht es auch schon hier oben auf dem Dach. Das ist sehr, sehr schön gestaltet. gestaltet. Und ähm, ihr seht halt hier auch sehr viele Charakter die ihr eventuell schon kennt aus dem Toberland oder halt ein paar neue Charakter, die jetzt noch dazugekommen sind. Also Merlin ist zum Beispiel da. Ähm, man hat hier äh, diese Zwergenwesen aus äh, Merlins Quest und ähm, ja, viele andere gestalten halt noch, die ihr entweder wie gesagt kennt oder jetzt bald dann hier auch kennenlernt. Und auch so vom Himmel ist es auch so, dass man hier auch so ein bisschen was aufnimmt. Auch so ähm, diese Thematisierung kennt man auch so ein bisschen von Merlins Quest und auch ja, so ein paar, paar Sachen halt auch vom äh, Restaurant hier im Bereich und dann ist es halt wirklich halt schon sehr, sehr cool, dass man das halt also ja, eins raus macht. Man, man separiert nicht einfach neue äh, Attraktionen, die hier im Bereich stehen sollen, die haben alle Hand und Fuß und alles zusammen ergibt halt Avalon und das finde ich halt auch am Tourland so gut. Äh, die Geschichte ist nie auserzählt, es kommt halt immer noch mal ein bisschen was dazu und äh, ja, es spricht halt einfach auch für die Qualität des Parks.
hier hinter mir befindet sich dann jetzt noch die kleine Themenfahrt. Es gibt das dann wirklich ganz kleine ähm, Wagen für Kinder. Äh, und hier seht ihr halt auch schon so ein bisschen, wie der Rundweg von dem Ganzen hier so ist. Man sieht ja auch schon, hier wird mit Wasser gearbeitet. Hier ist so ein bisschen Wasser. Und ähm, ja, das soll halt Merlins Garten sein, äh, den man da passiert, wo man durchfährt. Und da passieren halt auch so einige Sachen. Man fährt halt durch den Kräutergarten, durch Blumen und sowas. Und da gibt es dann halt auch ein paar interaktive Elemente. Es ist halt auf jeden Fall für kleine Kinder. Ihr seht hier auf jeden Fall, das ist dann halt auch noch das, äh, die Station, das Stationshaus. Und wenn wir gerade nochmal bei Wasser sind, dann ist es halt auch sehr interessant. Denn hier, wo wir hier gerade stehen oder wo ich gerade stehe, das gab es vorher nicht. Denn das hier, das war halt noch Teil vom See, der jetzt da hinten ist. Man hat das hier komplett trocken gelegt und dann hat man ähm, ja, hier praktisch diesen neuen Teilbereich von Avalon dann gestaltet und äh, gefertigt. So, das war die Baustellenführung und ja, nachdem wir jetzt hier ähm, durch den neuen Bereich gegangen sind, gibt es halt auch schon was Neues in diesem Jahr, äh, was schon aufgeführt wird. Ihr seht hier vielleicht schon im Hintergrund, Aqua Bella Torres, das ist die neue Parkshow. Dafür hat man hier ähm, eine komplett neue Bühne gebaut, die ich super, super toll finde, ähm, weil die halt hier diesen ganzen Bereich Port Laguna abrundet. Also man hat hier ähm, diese ganzen Häuserzeilen, die man hier drumherum hat, die hatte man halt bisher hier noch nicht. Da war zwar immer noch schon eine Bühne, manchmal war da so ein halbes Schiff oder so ähm, im Sommer, aber jetzt ist es halt praktisch komplett rund. Also dieser komplette Bereich Port Laguna, dieser Eingangsbereich ist jetzt komplett ähm, ja, rund mit allem und äh, ist damit auch abgeschlossen. Und hier wird jetzt eine neue Show aufgeführt, äh, wo es sehr viel um Wasser geht. Aber ja, wie genau diese Show aussieht, ich habe euch da jetzt mal ein paar Impressionen zusammengeschnitten und die folgen jetzt. Viel Spaß! Das war es jetzt hier mit dem Video. Ich hoffe, äh, es hat euch gefallen. Es waren sehr viele Eindrücke, die wir heute hier sammeln konnten. Äh, wir haben die Entstehungsgeschichte praktisch von der Erweiterung von Avalon äh, gezeigt bekommen. Wir waren auf der Baustelle, wir konnten uns alles angucken. Wir waren sogar nicht nur auf der Baustelle, sondern auch schon in den Attraktionen halt drin. Und äh, ja, haben jetzt hier nochmal die neue Show uns angucken dürfen. Also wirklich rundum auf jeden Fall ein äh, ja, gelungener Morgen, den wir hier hatten. Und wir können jetzt halt hier noch ein bisschen im Park verweilen und ja, den Tag hier im Park halt auch noch genießen. Ähm, ich fand es halt auch sehr, sehr cool, dass der Park ähm, hier an jeder ähm, Stelle, wo wir auf der Baustelle waren, dann da halt auch so eine Staffelei aufgebaut hatte und dort dann halt auch ja, die Renderings bzw. die Bilder, wie es dann halt später aussehen soll, ähm, ja, dann dort gezeigt hat. Und so konnte hat man direkt so den Vergleich, okay, so soll es aussehen und so sieht es jetzt aus, das kommt dahin, das kommt dahin. Fand ich auf jeden Fall sehr gut. Und ja, also so eine Baustellenführung ist halt auch nicht selbstverständlich in einem Freizeitpark. Und deswegen hier nochmal an dieser Stelle vielen lieben Dank an Tessa und seinem Team vom, äh, vom Toraland. Ich habe auf jeden Fall wieder sehr viel Spaß hier gehabt, habe sehr viele Eindrücke mit nach Hause bringen können und konnte sie euch hier in diesem Video präsentieren. Ich hoffe, ihr hattet auch damit Spaß. Dann lasst auf jeden Fall ein Like da, falls ihr Fragen habt zu dem Ganzen. Gerne ähm, unten in die Kommentare. Und natürlich, wenn das Ganze hier aufmacht, da bin ich natürlich wieder hier. Und dann gucken wir uns zusammen halt mal die ganzen Attraktionen an und da gibt es auch On-Rides und all das, dass halt dann, wenn dann halt auch dieser neue Bereich aufmacht, ihr wollt natürlich bestimmt jetzt wissen, wann ist es denn endlich soweit. Ja, die Antwort bleibt uns das Toverland aktuell noch schuldig. Ähm, da will man auch gar keine Angaben zu machen, verstehe ich aber auch. 2023 soll es aufmachen. Ich denke mal, irgendwann in den Sommermonaten wird es soweit sein. Aber wir haben ja jetzt auch gesehen, dass da noch einiges zu tun ist. Aber uns erwartet da auf jeden Fall Großes. Deswegen lasst ein Abo da, um dann das Video später hier aus dem Park nicht zu verpassen, wenn ihr alles auf hat und ich dann wieder hier bin. Und ansonsten wünsche ich euch so lange viel Spaß hier noch auf YouTube. Sage Dankeschön und bis bald.